Hello everyone and welcome back. In the previous session, we studied about the typical structure of the microprocessing unit. In this session, we are going to learn about the importance of registers in microprocessors. So without any further ado, let's get to learning. Coming to the topic that we are going to cover in this session, today we will learn about the importance of registers in MPU or microprocessing units. So let's begin. Now in the previous session, we had seen the typical structure of the MPU. There we also had a brief overview of the register section for 8085 microprocessor. Now today we are going to find out the answer to the question why exactly registers are used. Well, registers or set of flip-flops are used in the microprocessing unit for temporary storage of various kind of informations. Now what informations can that be? Now if you remember with every MPU, in the typical structure we already have seen the memory is associated, right? And inside the memory we have got different memory locations and in order to address them we have got the addresses. Now within the memory we can either store data or we can also store programs. Now what exactly is a program? Well it's nothing but the accumulation of different instructions. Therefore, the informations which can temporarily be stored inside the registers can be data. The information can also be the instruction. And since in order to access the memory locations of the memory, we need to specify the addresses. Hence, registers are also capable of storing the addresses. So do remember this, within a register, we can either store data or an instruction or an address. Now in case of 8-bit microprocessors, the registers are usually of the sizes 8-bit and 16-bit. Now why is that? In order to understand this, let's talk specifically about the Intel's 8085 microprocessor. We already know the word length of this is 8-bit. Now let's say in one of the general purpose registers of 8085, we would like to store the data 64H. Notice this is a hexadecimal value. And this H is specifying that, right? Now all the general purpose registers of 8085 is of 8 bit. Now what about 64? What do you think? Is it 8 bit in binary? Well, it is. If you remember the conversion from hexadecimal to binary, every single hexadecimal digit is nothing but a nibble in binary. Now what's a nibble in binary? Well, 4 bits comprises a nibble, right? So, 4, that is the least significant digit of hexadecimal, is going to be 0100 in binary. Now what about 6, that is this most significant digit of hexadecimal? Well, in binary, it is going to be 0110. Therefore, 0110, then 0100, all these 8 bits is a single byte. So in order to store this, we can use the general purpose register B. And the reason for that is, B can also store 8 bits. Now earlier, I also told you the registers can also store addresses, right? What if we would like to store the address 203A? I hope you can understand with the presence of this A symbol that it is also a hexadecimal number. So in binary, how many bits will it be? Well, four digit and every digit is actually four bits in binary. Therefore, four times four, 16. So this particular hexadecimal value, if it converted into binary, it is going to be 16 bits. Now within eight bits, can we store it? Not really. So we need to do something about it, don't we? Now if you remember, in the previous session, I told you the general purpose registers can also be used as pairs. And with B, we can pair up C. Now notice, B and C together is providing a 16-bit storage space. So clearly, now we can store this value. However, the most significant two digits, 0 and 2, will be stored in B, whereas the least significant two digits of hexadecimal 3 and A is going to be stored in C. 
So this is exactly the reason why in case of 8-bit microprocessors, the registers are usually of 8-bit or 16 bits. Because there might be two cases. Either we would like to store the data, which is of 8 bits, or we may need to store the addresses as well, which are of 16 bits. Now I believe why the registers are used is clear to you. Remember, they are used to store the data, addresses, as well as the instructions. Let's now understand the importance of registers in a greater detail. Suppose we have to compute this particular expression. Notice, on the left hand side of it, we have got y, and we are going to assign to it a into b plus c into d plus e into f. Now, say we have got two microprocessing units, and they are MPU1 and MPU2. Now, if you focus on the register sections of these, in case of MPU1 within the register section, we have got two different registers, R1 and R2. On the other hand, in case of MPU2 within the register section, we have got the single register R. Now we all know the expressions are comprised of operands and operations. And operands are nothing but data. And we use registers to store data. Let's now see the sequence of instructions if we use MPU1 to evaluate this particular expression. Remember, we have got two registers R1 and R2 in MPU1. Now focus on the expression y equals a into b plus c into d plus e into f. So clearly, this is sum of products, isn't it? We are performing multiplications and then additions, right? So how we are going to do it? At first, in case of MPU1, in register R1, we will load the operand A. Now with A, we are supposed to multiply B. Now within R1, we already have got A. So in the next step, we are going to perform this. That is, the current content of the register R1, which is A, with that we will multiply B, and the result we are going to store within R1 itself. Therefore, at this point, within the register R1, we have got this portion of the expression. Now we have got another register R2, right? And after a into b, we need to perform c into d. Therefore, within r2, let's load the operand c. And following this way, let's have within r2, c into d. Remember, r2 before this operation was currently holding c. And by the end of this, within r2, we will have c into d. Now notice, within r1, we have got A into B, and within R2, we have got C into D. We don't really have any more registers to perform E into F. So what do you think? How should we perform E into F now? Let me tell you how. We will follow these two ways. That is, what if we add R1's content with R2's content, and then store the result back to R1? Wouldn't that be great? Observe, A into B is getting added with C into D. And this entire portion is now loaded within R1. So now we can use R2 to perform E into F. And we are going to do that in the same way. So at step 6, we are going to load R2 with E. And in step 7, we are going to have in R2 E into F. Now notice, within R2 we have this, and in R1 we have got this particular portion of the expression. All we have to do is perform the addition between these two. And we already know how to do that. Within R1 we are going to store R1 plus R2. So clearly, now within R1 we have got the entire right hand side of this expression. But we are not done yet, right? Because in this expression, we also have the left hand side. That is, this entire portion is supposed to be assigned to y. 
Therefore, we will need another step where to y, we will assign the value which is inside R1. So, this is how using two registers R1 and R2, we can evaluate this expression. Let's now learn how we can do the same using MPU2, which has a single register. Now, if you come back to the expression, we are supposed to perform the same thing. And we can also begin in the same way, that is within R, we can at first load A, that is the operand A of the expression. And thereafter, with the current content of R, that is A, we can multiply B, also store the outcome in R itself. Now what? We don't really have any other storages to evaluate the rest of the expression. So, what to do now? Well, if you remember, with every microprocessing unit, we have got the associated memory. Now, within the memory, we have got so many different locations. So, just to keep it simple for now, let's suppose we are going to use only a single location of the memory and we are going to call it MEM. Now, after step 2, when we already have A into B within R, we need the register to be free in order to evaluate the rest of the expression. So, what we are going to do? Within that particular memory location, we are going to store the content of the register R. Now, R is free. And using this particular way, we can perform C into D. So, let's do that. So, by the time it is step number 5, we will have C into D within R. Now, again, R is occupied, right? But we can still free it. However, since we are using only a single memory location, before freeing R, we need to perform something. That is, within that memory location, we currently have A into B, and within R, we have got C into D. We are anyway going to perform this addition. So, what if within R, with the previous content that is C into D, we add the memory location's content, which is A into B, and then store the result back to R? Clearly, by this time, we have got A into B plus C into D within the register R. Now, we can go ahead and free the register R by placing its content back to that particular memory location. And since R is free once again, we can go ahead and perform E into F. And we already know we will require two more steps to perform that. So, by the end of step number 9, within the register R, we will have E into F. Now, we are only left with this addition and we know this portion of the expression is already inside the memory location. So, once again, if we add the content of the register R with the content within the memory and then store the result back to R, we can have the entire right hand side of this expression within the register R. However, do remember we are not done yet. We still need to assign this entire right hand side to the left hand side. Therefore, to Y, we will go ahead and assign the content of the register R. So, this is how using a single register of the MPU2, we can evaluate this particular expression. The only thing to remember in this way is, we need to take help from the memory. So, we just saw the two different ways to evaluate this expression. In case of MPU2, we took 11 steps. Whereas in case of MPU1, which had two different registers, we wrapped it up within nine steps. So clearly, having more number of registers mean, while we will be writing down the program, it will need less number of instructions. Now think about it. If our program contains lesser number of instructions, in that case, it will require lesser memory space. Isn't it? Now in case of MPU1, since we had two different registers, we evaluated the expression very easily without thinking about the memory usage. Whereas in case of MPU2, since we had only a single register, here we had to access the memory four different times. Now think about it. Registers 
are on chip memory locations within the microprocessing unit on the other hand when we talk about the memory these are distinct device so whenever memory is being accessed the required time is actually way higher than the time required to access the registers and the reason for that is registers are sections within the microprocessing unit itself so clearly for mpu1 the execution time is way faster than mpu2 finally since in case of mpu1 we had more number of registers and due to this reason we evaluated the expression without even thinking about the memory usage therefore if we have more number of registers the program becomes easy to write so due to these reasons having registers is actually very important in microprocessing units so in this session we cover the topic the importance of registers in mpu or microprocessing units all right people that will be all for this session from the next session onwards we will get into the details of the register section of 8085 so i hope to see you in the next ones thank you all for watching